Welcome to www.ilovehistory.co.uk Shame Question Understand This video looks at England under Elizabeth and considers in particular the importance of the court and ministers in government. As well as thinking about importance when preparing for this key question, you should also consider the success of each of the institutions. At its most basic, the royal court was simply the members of the gentry and nobility who turned up each day to see Elizabeth. The historian Penry Williams estimates that there were 200 important positions within it. In the Queen's presence there would be masks, entertainment, music, plays, tournaments, foreign ambassadors would be entertained while the business of government took place and privy council meetings were held. The court allowed Elizabeth to see and control her leading subjects, to employ and reward them. It reflected her power and her magnificence. It's notable that Elizabeth never built any palaces during her reign, but her courtiers did. Cecil with Hatfield House, Dudley with Kenilworth, and the magnificence of the courtiers reflected the magnificence of the Queen. The image of the Queen was celebrated, particularly in events such as the Accession Day tilts, with the Queen's champion from the 1570s competing supposedly for the Queen's honour. Royal progresses went out in half of the summers of Elizabeth's reign, and when Elizabeth travelled, the court travelled with her. The historian Christopher Haig has described these as major public relations exercises. The court seems to have been a centre for promoting the Gloriana myth. It was also the source of all political power, and its importance for courtiers is perhaps best shown by the use of exclusion from court as a punishment, as with Leicester and Walsingham. When looking at Elizabeth's government, it's necessary to consider the role of her ministers, probably the most important of whom was William Cecil. He was cunning, for example when he borrowed money from Spanish ships en route to the Netherlands in 1568. He was persuasive, as when he pushed for English intervention in Scotland in 1560. And most importantly, he was trusted, Elizabeth made him Lord Burley in 1571 and appointed him Lord Treasurer in 1572. When he lay dying in 1598, Elizabeth fed him soup by hand. The historian McCaffrey has described Cecil as the dynamo which kept Elizabethan government running smoothly and effectively. Sloane describes him as being pragmatic and effective. But it is important to remember that he was not acting on his own. Robert Dudley had been the Queen's childhood sweetheart, and she made him Earl of Leicester in 1564. In 1585, she finally allowed him to lead an expeditionary force to the Netherlands. He was a favourite, but not that effective. By contrast, Sir Francis Walsingham worked for 20 years as Elizabeth's principal secretary. In that time, he showed strong Protestant convictions and controlled an extensive spy network protecting the Queen. It's important to note the change in personnel at the end of Elizabeth's reign. Dudley died in 1588, Walsingham in 1590, Hatton in 91, and William Cecil in 1598. In their place, a younger generation appeared. Men like Robert Cecil, her pygmy, and Robert Devereux dominated the 1590s. Another important part of Elizabethan government was the Privy Council. It advised the Queen and implemented her decisions on matters to do with religion, economics, the Queen's security and military matters. Sloan says there was no aspect of life beyond the scope of the Council. It reduced down from 50 members under Mary to 19 at the start of Elizabeth's reign and just 13 by 1601. Elizabeth claimed, A multitude doth make rather discord and confusion. There was also a shift on the men who sat on the council. Instead of important magnates such as Norfolk and Winchester, Elizabeth appointed self-made men, administrators such as Cecil, Bacon, Thomas Smith and Thomas Wilson. There was also a smaller presence of religious men, Whitgift being a rare exception. The council also met more often, three or four times a week in the 1560s and daily by the end of her reign. But a great deal of council time was wasted on parochial matters and adjudicating on quarrels. Equally, by the end of the reign, Haig says that the council had become dangerously narrow and weak, with councillors being replaced by their sons 
and most of the councillors being related to each other or the Queen. To reach a judgment on the importance of the court and ministers in government, it's necessary to consider the role of Elizabeth herself. After all, as she said to Dudley in 1566, I will have here but one mistress and no master. It was Elizabeth who took decisions on peace and war, rejected legislation from Parliament which she disliked, selected her council and her servants. She had a natural authority from the start of her reign. Her childhood tutor, Roger Ascombe, described the 16-year-old Elizabeth as exempt from female weakness. She had an ability to control her council. She participated in debate, kept detailed notes, consulted with foreign ambassadors, and used a mixture of affection and tantrums. Her blasts be not the storms of other princes, claimed Cecil. But in 1598 she certainly wasn't beyond boxing the ears of the errant Earl of Essex. Moreover, as Queen, Elizabeth had the power to put her subjects under house arrest, as with Arundel, to imprison them, as with Davison and Croft, and even, eventually, to execute them, as with Norfolk and Essex. But one of the key tools that Elizabeth used in running her government was faction. Elizabeth deliberately created divisions in her court and council, factions, to encourage men to compete for awards, patronage, to show their loyalty, and to prevent the council from ever uniting to force a decision upon her. For example, in 1561, the Dudley marriage was stopped by Cecil spreading rumours about the suspicious circumstances of Dudley's wife's death. Dudley achieved his revenge in 1567, when he successfully blocked a marriage to Archduke Charles of Austria, and again in 1579 with the Duke of Alencon. But it wasn't just marriage where Elizabeth was able to use faction to avoid a decision. It took place in foreign policy too, with the question of intervention in the Netherlands dividing the council for seven years, with Leicester and Walsingham arguing for intervention and Cecil arguing against. And the matter was only finally settled in 1585 with intervention. Only once did the council unite against her on a major decision, and then it was a somewhat strange case of the execution of Mary Queen of Scots in 1587. However, faction also highlights some of the failures of Elizabeth's government towards the end of her reign. By the 1590s, faction was out of control, with divisions over Ireland, the disastrous appointment of Essex in 1598, and his eventual rebellion in 1601. Robert Cecil was then left supreme, and as Haig says, Elizabeth threw in her lot with the Sicilians. Moreover, her ordinary income had failed to keep up with inflation, and the Crown more than ever was reliant on parliamentary subsidy taxes. Elizabeth was the most important factor in Elizabethan government, both in its early successes and its eventual failures.